Listen, we've got, uh, we've got a deep dive. So I'm telling you, Romans chapters 9, 10, and 11 is not for the faint of heart. I kind of laid that down last week as well, and it's going to be, listen, if you're not into Bible study, you need to skip the next few months. <laughs> you can go, whatever you're going to do, come back later. This is deep stuff, but I tell you what, jokingly, of course, if you stick this out and come to the end of chapter 11, um, it's going to be remarkable how you see the nature of God and what God has promised us, he cannot fail you. You need to know that. He, God keeps his promises not because you're so sweet. He keeps his promises completely irrelevant of you and me. He has sworn by himself, to himself, to keep his promises. You and I, like kids who maybe have grown up, I'm making it up right now. Imagine if all of us found out that we were related to the Rothschilds and you're all a bunch of bazillionaires all of a sudden. We did nothing, we knew nothing, but we became bene benefits or we received the benefits of. God did all the work, he did all the lifting, he paid the price, he made an agreement to keep it empowered forever with himself, and then turns around and gifts all those who'll trust Christ with all that he's gotten for us. And it's all of God's grace, and it's all of God's favor. It's absolutely awesome. And so Paul, with his, with his remarkable Jewish history, him being a Hebrew of the Hebrews, he says of himself, that he was circumcised on the eighth day of the tribe of Benjamin... He gives his pedigree and Paul announces that if you want to meet God on Jewish standards, Paul says, you're going to have to beat me because I'm at the front of the line. And then he turns right around and announces, and all of that means nothing. That's why, by the way, today Paul is hated among the Jewish circles. Because Paul is the one who nobody has met the demands and the, the, the degree that Paul has. The guy was a genius, but he was also schooled by Gamaliel and was one of the greatest minds, if not the greatest mind ever converted to Christianity to this day. So if you were to arm wrestle him with his brain, you're going to lose. But Paul doesn't lean on that. He says, everything that I've gained in this world, in, in religion, the moment I met Christ, I found out all of it was nothing. What was he saying? He was saying that you can't relate to God and experience God on a relationship of legalism or what I can achieve or do for God to get his favor. Paul says you relate to God based upon the invitation of an experience to know him personally. Nobody, listen, if somebody says to you, I love you because of all the things you give me, that's not love. If somebody says, I love you because, and then you would pressure them, because why? I, the, the list is endless, but don't I ever drive you crazy? Yeah, quite often. <laughs> that has nothing to do with my love for you. Well, tell me some more. Well, how about this? Let's spend the rest of our lives together and I'll tell you as we go along. And that's what God does with us. He loves us. And here is, in Romans chapter 9, some of the most difficult theological struggles in the Bible. And yet, I want to recommend to all of you, God didn't give it to us to confuse us. He gave this to us for us to enjoy and believe and rest. And the amazing thing about it, as you listen over the course of these next several weeks uh, in this section from chapters 9 to 11, if you find yourself getting like, what, I don't know if I, I don't like that. I don't know if, well, you need to calm down because in God, there is no injustice. He's completely right all the time and rooted and based in his love that when he says something, you need to ask yourself are you actually a real believer or not? That might be the issue. So this is going to demand our attention. 
So church family, I'm going to give you a, a little bit of an intro before we stand to read the scriptures. We're looking at a message series titled, The Choice Is It Yours? And you're going to write that down. The choice is it yours? And of course, we're talking about the sovereignty of God in these chapters of Romans 9, 10, and 11. And I, I floated this out to you last week and that I promised you I would remind you of this. And regarding the choice is it yours, I put this out there. The choice is yours, but where did the ability to choose come from? You want to ask yourself that question. And where did the opportunity to choose come from? And why are you and I personally held responsible for the choices that we do make? Now, I say that this way. Responsible, listen, for those in heaven, they didn't get to heaven because they were smart enough to figure out the gospel and they honored God by choosing God. That's not how it works. God gave them the opportunity that when the gospel was presented... They responded. The response to the gospel was given by God. Are you hearing me? It wasn't your brain or your wisdom that figured it out and, and, and added uh, Jesus onto your life. You and I were lost without hope in this world. But God gave the opportunity for you to hear the gospel. That's a gift. And then to respond to the affirmative, yes, Lord, I want you in my life. That's a gift. So that when you and I enter heaven, we are going to be praising God for him doing it all. But the reverse is also true in this sense. For those who wind up waking up in hell, having rejected Jesus all their lives, blowing him off, rejecting him, they wind up in a Christless eternity because that's what they wanted. That's what they chose. God didn't send them there. Friends, you cannot find anywhere in the Bible where the Bible says that God sends them there. He orders them there. No, no, no. Those that are in hell are responsible for their own choice, and they know it. The way of salvation was provided for them. They rejected it. Does that make sense? I hope it does. He gets all the glory. But for those who are suffering in a Christless eternity, they're responsible for their own rejection. The price was paid, but some reject, many reject, according to Jesus, that offer. And by way of introduction to this, again, Romans chapter 8, verses 29 to 30 tells us, for whom he foreknew, and I tell you over and over again, circle the word foreknew. You want to circle that in your Bible, highlight it, draw arrows to it, everything. It's all based on God's foreknowledge that he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son that he might be the firstborn or preeminent one or prototype among many brethren. Moreover, whom he predestined, these he also called. And oh, by the way, they all go together. This is a package deal. You don't have three of these and missing the others. It's all one. Whom he predestined, these he also called. Whom he called, these he also justified. And whom he justified, these he also glorified. The best part about that last closing statement is that for those of us, listen, we've been glorified in Christ Jesus. I know you don't feel like it. I know you lost an hour of sleep last night. <laughs> Maybe you got up and you needed ibuprofen. That's because, listen, positionally we've been glorified in Christ, but practically you and I are waiting to experience that. Here's some good news. If we all drop dead today or we get raptured, no more ibuprofen. <laughs> you won't need it. We're going to enter into his presence and it's going to feel just fine. It's going to feel great. But all of this is in play, all of this is being played out, all of this is secured, as we'll see today, in the life of the believer. So very important. So church, with that, let's stand, and I will read Romans 9, verse 1. If you'll pick it up out loud and read Romans uh, 2 and 4 and 6 and so on in the even-numbered verses. You guys ready? Okay, five of you are ready. This is great. Okay, come on. I tell you the truth, in Christ, I am not lying, my conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Spirit, that I have great sorrow and continual grief in my heart. For I could wish that I myself were accursed or cut off from Christ, for my brethren, my countrymen, according to the flesh, who are Israelites, to whom pertain to adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, Service of God and the promises. 
of whom are the fathers and from whom, according to the flesh, Christ, that's Messiah, came, who is over all the eternally blessed God. Amen. But it is not that the word of God has taken no effect, for they are not all Israel who are of Israel. Verse 7, nor are they all children. Listen, everybody. Nor are they all children because they are the seed of Abraham. But in Isaac your seed shall be called. That is, those who are the children of the flesh. These are not the children of God, but the children of promise are counted as a seed. For this is the word of promise. At this time I will come, and Sarah shall have a son. And not only this, but when Rebekah also had conceived by one man, even by our father Isaac. And here's our parenthetical insert for the children, not yet being born, nor having done any good or evil, that the purpose of God, according to election, might stand, not of works, but of him who calls. It is said to her, the oldest shall serve the younger. As it is written, Jacob I have loved, but Esau I have hated. You say, man, that's tough. Say, what? This is where Christians stumble on the glance of this. Well, I thought God loved everybody. Well, he does love everybody. But we're going to find out later on that when it says, Jacob I have loved and Esau have I hated, what I want to remind you guys about, even though this is not what the Bible study is pertaining to today exactly, this statement comes out of the Old Testament, and it's a statement that is made long after Jacob and Esau had ever been born. They lived their lives. They died of old age. And they were in eternity. And then God in the book of Malachi makes this comment. Are you hearing me? So the question is going to be, why? Why would God love Jacob? In fact, this is the amazing thing. People say, why would God hate Esau? Well, you're going to find out why. And when, you, when we read the word hate, uh, it's, the, it's the fact that Esau did wickedness. And you're going to find out. But Jacob, Jacob was no saint. In fact, people have struggled with Esau, have I hated? I struggle with Jacob, have I loved? <laughs> How could God love Jacob? Well, wait a minute. How could God love Jack? How could God love you? Say, Pastor, you don't know me. I'm wonderful. <laughs> you just keep looking at yourself as a legend in your own mind. We know you. And the Bible says, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Amen. Father, we pray that you'd speak to us from your word. For your word alone is truth. And we pray that it would be seated deep within our souls. Thank you, God. Thank you. In this world, more than ever, thank you that heaven is real. It is eternal. We're on our way there. And Father, we just can't get there soon enough. You're precious. And we can't wait to see you. Until then, Lord, cause us to be faithful unto thee. In Jesus' name and all God's people said, amen. amen. You may be seated. So church... I'll as we go through these three chapters, always keep this in mind that the issue, and this is kind of fun, I almost feel like I need to have like a, a prop, and the prop would be a, a big chalkboard, and I would be wiping it clear of all kinds of words, all kinds of things, all kinds of denominations, all kinds of persuasions, all kinds of religions, just wiping the board completely clean so there's nothing on it, and that we would just have the Bible. I mean, what's wrong with that? just the Bible. What would you conclude? What would happen to you if there was no earthly external input in your life or mine except the Bible and the Holy Spirit using the Word of God to teach us? Where would we land? Do you know that we'd all land in the same spot? God using the Word, the Holy Spirit speaking, no human intervention whatsoever, and we'd come to the same spot. If we just stuck to the Bible, how do you, what do you mean by that? Well, because from Genesis to Revelation, the entire revelation of the Bible, 66 books, is actually about one, I'll, I'll say issue, but that's not a, a very good way to put it, but I'll just say it's all about one issue. And this one issue was the issue that concerned uh, Abraham. It was the issue that concerned Moses. It's the issue that concerned the prophets. It's the same issue, by the way, that that concerned all the psalmists. Same issue. Same common denominator. 
It's the same one that of all of the apostles or New Testament authors, same issue. Moving forward into the future events of the book of Revelation, same issue. There's one issue from Genesis to Revelation, and the answer, by the way, is two grand bookends. In Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, the Bible says that after Adam and Eve had sinned, that God would send them a deliverer. Did you know that? In Genesis 3, 15, the Bible tells us that through Eve would eventually be born through her descendants, the seed from her, the one would come who is none other than the Savior of the world. The issue is then concluded in the book of Revelation where eternity is commenced and there in the presence of eternity is none other than the Lamb of God who appears to all those in heaven as though he were a lamb that had been slain for the sins of the world. And it's none other than Christ the Messiah. Christ the Messiah. But did you realize that there's one name in association with that one issue or with that one person, and that it is Jesus? You can't get around it. He goes by various names that we don't have the time to go through now in this session together. But the name of Jesus, you and I know from the Greek or the Western world. But his name appears throughout all scripture. Even with the source of the name of God himself, out of the book of Isaiah, Yah, or Yahweh, Yehovah. It is absolutely awesome to realize that now, knowing this, if you read the Bible, being a Jew or a Gentile, this is where we start to get, there's going to be people that are going to start struggling now with what I'm, where I'm going. Jew or Gentile, Jew or non-Jew, if you read the Bible... And let God's word speak to you. You just may find out that regarding pedigree or bloodline, God could care less. And this is a shock to legalism, to legalists, religionists. It's a shock. And yet Paul the Apostle, with genius, unpacks this completely. We're now in our second installment. The first installment was this, found in verses 1 through 5, and that is the scope of God's sovereignty. We learned this about it, that in verses 1 and 2, that it includes sorrow and grief and, over the lost. Paul said, I wish myself accursed. Now listen, this is a big prayer. Paul knows the Lord like you and I have never yet known him. Jesus revealed himself to Paul personally. Paul goes around and says, I would rather have myself cut out of eternal life that my brethren in the DNA of the Jews might be grafted in or might be brought into the kingdom. And listen, you can almost hear heaven applaud by saying, that is so amazing. Paul, that's so amazing, but stop it. It doesn't work that way. Moses did the same thing. Oh God, please blot my name out of your book. If these people might be saved, take me out and put them in. And God says, it doesn't work that way. Powerfully. And Paul says, I sorrow and I grieve over the fact that my brethren, the Jews, do not recognize that Jesus is the Messiah as they ought in total, in totality. Church family, you've heard of Israel being the chosen people, the Jew being the chosen people. God chose them for a mission. Now, that mission has been delayed. And it will happen in the near future, I believe, not too distant future. But it was Israel that was called by God to preach the gospel to the ends of the earth. But the religious side of Judaism kept that from happening. And so the Bible tells us that the Gentiles began to hear the gospel preached by many Jews who did believe, and the church eventually became predominantly Gentile. But that's going to change in the tribulation period. The Bible makes that very clear. But Paul says, I grieve over them. And uh, I think that's something you and I need to check our hearts. I need to check my hearts. How many people do I come in contact with that are lost? And I don't grieve. I don't lose sleep over them. I don't cry for them. If I believe in heaven, isn't it incumbent upon me to believe in hell? If I'm going to heaven because Jesus died for me, and 
45 plus years ago, I responded to the gospel. Should not my heart break with Paul's over those people that you and I know? Do you, are all of your friends going to heaven? What about your children? Are they all going? If the rapture happened today, are they going? If they're not going, that should break our hearts. And that's a challenge to me. We also learned that it involves love and compassion and mercy. That we would give of ourselves. We also learned that it incorporates the full counsel of God in verses 1 through 5. That God's word is the answer. And we're to read God's word and know God's word because the answer is completely there. The, the Jews in Jesus' day were held responsible to know the word of God. By the way, all people in the world today are held responsible to know the word of God. Every single one of us today in this modern age. So we pick it up here, church. This is our second argument, verses 6 through 9. And that is the security of God's sovereignty. This should give you great comfort. Begins in verse 6. The security of his, uh, of his sovereign word. When God speaks. God, who is not a man, the Bible says, cannot lie. When God speaks, he speaks the truth. And the Bible tells us in verse 6 right here, in the opening part of verse 6, it says, but it is not that the word of God has taken no effect. When he speaks about this, uh, the Jews not believing, that not all who say they're Israel are of Israel. What does this mean? What's the result? Those that say they are Jews, but not all of them are Jews. Is it the lack of God's word being powerful? Has God's word failed? Will God's word ever fail you? Never fail you. God's word cannot fail. The only reason why you and I would say, this is not working, it's because of us, not him. And they refused to believe. Jesus had to contend with it. They had taken the revelation of God and they had made it into a man-made religion. And they set up all of these orders and all of these do's and don'ts. And all God desire and desires is a personal relationship. And you come to know that by his awesome sovereign word when God speaks to you. He says, listen, does this, does this attract you? God says, I have loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, with loving kindness, do I draw you. The word draw means he pulls you in, but he doesn't, he doesn't um, make you love him. That would not be a, a relationship. That would be tyranny. His love for us is clearly revealed in Scripture. But this is pretty, uh, I think, powerful for us. When you look at verse 6 and the opening words of it, but it is not that the Word of God. Mark it down in your notes. That's the logos of God, the logos. That beautiful word, logos, and this is the meaning of it, logos. The logos is the embodiment of thought. Think about that. When the Word, Jesus, became flesh and dwelt among us. Right, everybody? Are you guys awake? Yeah. Okay. So the Logos is the embodiment of a, of a thought. This is fun. Jesus, what does this mean? It means that Jesus is the manifestation of the will of God. You could actually see the will of God when you're watching and listening to Jesus minister 2,000 years ago. Can you imagine? You're watching the will of God be lived out on earth. An idea, an expression. It is the embodiment of a statement, an answer, an utterance, an appearance. It is the divine revelation of the divine thought and is the communication of the most perfect thought, information, or intelligence to another. In other words, it's communicated. The Logos, by being the very Logos, Jesus Christ is to be spoken of, is to be announced. I love this. Jesus Christ, the name of Jesus, the word of God itself, was never to be contained in a box or hidden. It is to be announced to the world that for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever would believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life. That Christ died on the cross for our sins. He rose again from the grave for our justification. That's to be preached among the world. Never contained. God's sovereign word, when it goes out, people have to decide on it. Let's be honest. I know you're wringing your hands, you're frustrated, you see your son or your daughter or your mom or your dad, they're just not responding to the gospel. Just pray. But just know this. 
Ask God to intervene. Ask God, Lord, wake them up. Lord, cause your mercy to fall upon them. You pray and you battle like that in prayer. But know this. God's word goes out and his children will respond to his word. And he knows this. He's always known this. And God has never existed without knowing this. It's called foreknowledge. We read it a moment ago. And that's a strong foundation for where we're going. Revelation chapter 1 verse 1 is a beautiful picture of this logos being revealed. It says the revelation of Jesus Christ. The book of Revelation is the apocalyptic or the revealing or the, the pulling of the drape, so to speak. Imagine you have a statue and you're going to reveal the statue. You pull off the covering and that is the apocalypsis. The revealing of the statue. Okay, are you with me? The book of Revelation is pulling off the veil of who Jesus Christ is. And it's awesome. Read always the book of Revelation. You should read it all the time. The Bible, the book of Revelation says you should read it all the time. Because number one, it says, God says, I'll bless those who read it. And I'll bless those who hear it being read. You want to bless your family? Read the book of Revelation to them. So you got to be kidding me. I'm not kidding you. But I will tell you this, the book of Revelation has a presupposition to it. it. It supposes you've already read the Old Testament. You will never understand the book of Revelation unless you read the Old Testament. It's impossible. What's mentioned in the Old is fulfilled in the book of Revelation. That book will unlock things to you, not make you more confused, unlock things to you. But God's word is effective even if people don't believe it. This is what Paul is saying in the front end of verse 6 is God's word never fails. In fact, the word, listen, when it says that, uh, it's not that it has not taken any effect. The word effect means to drop off or to to diminish. Uh, God's word does not drop off in strength. So the Bible, it's so old. I can't believe you get up in the morning and you guys go to that church and you, well, you just gather around an old book. It's not an old book. This thing is alive and it's... And listen, there's stuff that hasn't even happened yet that's written in this book and it's, we're waiting for it to happen. This thing's alive. Okay? It's not the newspaper. To drop off or to, or to diminish, to fade away. The Bible doesn't fade away. It doesn't lose power. It doesn't fail. It's not going to fail. Church family, the effectiveness of the word of God. It doesn't need to be charged. It doesn't need to be pumped up. I don't know if this is good or bad, but the other day, like last night actually, over by PF Chang, you know, there's a whole lineup of Teslas getting charged up. Some people are sitting in their car reading books. Seriously, so like, what are they doing in there? They're reading a book. Why are they reading a book? Because they're charging their batteries. And I, this one guy, you got to hand, I've never seen this happen before. You, you got to hand it this guy. Some guy pulled up in a big Ford pickup truck and just parked right in one of those Tesla parks. <laughs> I mean, he turned off his, he had his diesel going and turned that thing off. He got off and he just walked into P.F. Chang's and I'm thinking, that's awesome. He didn't plug it in. He couldn't find a parking spot. So he parked where the electric car is supposed to park. Ate his dinner, got back in his truck. The people are still sitting there reading their book. (laughs) God's word's not like that. In fact, tonight, if the the conditions are right and everything goes off, at about 7.13 this evening, look to the west and watch uh, Elon Musk launch a rocket. And you'll see it go out. And listen, that thing not only picks up speed, but once it gets into space, it keeps going. And you're going to watch it. You'll lose sight of it just south of Hawaii by the time it's just a little speck. What's going on? It's accelerating. And then it gets into an atmosphere that it doesn't diminish. It just keeps going. Think about that regarding the Bible. God launched the Bible through his prophets. He launched the Bible through Abraham. He launched the Bible through Moses, through Deborah. You name the great men and women of the Bible. And that truth of his never diminishes. It keeps going. It doesn't run out. Well, that was then. Today's now. The Bible doesn't lose any power. What we need to do is align ourselves with the strength of God's word. I want to see God move. So do I. So let's find out where he's moving or what he wants to do to move. 
His, his word is alive, and God says in Isaiah 55, 11, I'm going to send it out to accomplish whatever I've intended it to do, and it will not return unto me void. The power of God's word is absolutely awesome. And you know something about this, and how beautiful this is, that God would personify his word in John chapter 1, very familiar to all of us as Christians, John 1 Verse 1, that is in the beginning, that was of physical universe. In the beginning of the physical universe was, that is was already, the Logos, the Word. And the Logos, the Word, was with God and the Word was God. Let that sink in. He, the Logos, was in the beginning with God. So when physical universe is being created, he was already there. Jesus was never created. The cults create Jesus. That's why they're a cult. Jesus has never been created. Jesus is the eternal Son of God, Savior, the second person of the Holy Trinity, as revealed in the Bible. Thus the Elohim of the Bible. God in singular plurality. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Awesome. All things were made through him, And without him, nothing was made that was made. Verse 14. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, John says. The glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Is that awesome? That is absolutely incredible. The logos of God never diminishes. Never loses power. The security of God's sovereign word is at work in your life. Are you a follower of Christ today? Guess what? He is committed to himself to get you into heaven. What do I need to do? Stay out of the way. Let him get it done. He'll do it. Follow him. Jesus never said, now, here we go. You lead. No, Jesus said, here we go. You follow. Isn't that great? Don't you like to follow? I like to follow. I've always struggled with God personally. Don't tell anybody about this. I'm... I'm really good at, at, at following. I'm really good at it. I think growing up in a Marine Corps home had a lot to do with that. But it made a lot of sense to me becoming a Christian. And I, if I were to ever be in the ministry, I would have picked being an assistant pastor. Because I just, just what do you need done? I'll do it. Because I have no problem doing what I'm doing to God. It doesn't matter who the guy is. I'm going to do it. To, I'm doing it for God. And I love that stuff. And um, there's liberty. You know, I don't know if you know this or not, but there's a lot of liberty in obedience. You know, God calls us his children. He doesn't call us his slaves. But did you know the word servant in the Bible is the word slave? You say, well, which one is it? It's both. The more you get to know God, the more you fall in love with who he is as a person that when you come to him in a relationship, you want to be his biblical slave. So what is a biblical slave? A doulos or douloi. A doulos. So what is that? That means, listen, in the Roman world, if I owed somebody money and I couldn't pay them, then I had to go into servitude to their world and I had to mow their lawn, trim their tree, what milk their cow, whatever it was, until, until I had my debt paid off. Are you with me? But during that time, if I met, a, maybe I met this woman, and she's also in servitude, and we get married. This happened all the time in the Roman world. And then we had kids. We still work for the same boss. He's the guy that we couldn't pay back. So we're working off our debt, but I worked off my debt before my wife works off her debt, and I've got the kids, and I realized, you know what, excuse me, sir, but you're a good master. I have flourished under this time of servitude to you. I don't want to go. Well, your wife's got three more years to pay off her debt. Well, listen, you're so good to me, good to us, I want to give you my life. So the master would say, that's awesome. I want to keep you. I I, I love you. I love you. Then let's settle it. They go out to the porch. the, The guy puts his ear on a piece of wood right there, and the owner takes a nail and puts a, it's called an awl, puts a earring in there. All the guys are going, what? And all the girls are going, is it gold? Is it diamond? 
You look cross. It's an announcement. I have a good master. I've chosen to give him the rest of my life to serve him. And that relationship is very descriptive of the Christian relationship with God the Father. Listen, he calls, he, he says, call me Father, you are my children. And then out of that love, we turn around and say, whatever you want done, whatever you're going to do, Lord, send me. It's that sweet, it is that beautiful, because the Logos has communicated to us that he has been and has provided for us salvation. Philippians chapter 2, verse 12 says, Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling or reverential awe. For it is, Look at verse 13. For it is God who works in you. You say, well, wait a minute. You just said work out your own salvation. Then it says, for God is, uh, it is God who works in you both to will and do of his good pleasure. What's the answer? Yes, that's true. The answer is yes. Present yourself and God the Spirit will do your work of life. in your. You're just to yield. Does that make sense, people? And this is going to be important because Abraham is going to be commended in a moment. The works of Abraham will be commended. I'm going to ask you in advance. Be thinking, what are the works of Abraham? In Luke chapter 24, verse 44, Luke 24, 44, we're still talking about the security of his sovereign word. It says there that Jesus said to them, this is the latter evening now, of Resurrection Sunday, these are the words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses. Everybody, Jesus is the issue. Christ is the issue of the entire Bible. Jesus is speaking here in Luke 24, 44. Listen. Everything that's been written from Moses and the prophets and the Psalms concerning who? Me. Jesus is speaking and he says, the whole book is written about my life, about me, about my person. We don't believe in Jesus because what? Because it's Jesus. Well, you know, I'm born in the Western world. Christianity uh, was the dominant religion and I guess I'm a Christian. No, 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 no. No, it's Jesus because the Bible from Genesis 3.15 to the book of Revelation chapter 22, it's all about Jesus. And Jesus says so right there. By the way, if anybody ever tells you, remember, oh, you know, Jesus never said he was God. This is a verse right here that Jesus is announcing the entire Bible was written about me. I mean, that's pretty wild. Think about it. Well, I believe Jesus was a great prophet. I don't. That's crazy. Well, I believe he's a very good person, the best person ever. I don't. That's crazy. Well, why do you say that? Because if you're saying he's the best person ever, but he's not God, then how do you explain this? Jesus said, if you die believing in me, you'll live forever. Jesus says, you come to me, your sins will be forgiven. Either that's crazy, or he's God. Oh, he's a good prophet. No, 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 no. You can't be a good prophet and pull that off. And you can't be a good person and say such things without being God. And yet everything he did, he said that he was going to do it in advance. It's called the Bible. Absolutely awesome. Verse 45, and he, that is the Logos, opened their understanding that they might comprehend the scriptures, that they might, in a sense, behold him. Absolutely remarkable. Security. Listen, Christian, don't say anything out loud. Right now, where you're at, do you understand that you cannot save yourself. None of us can. That's why Jesus went to the cross. You can't do it. You cannot reform yourself. You cannot improve yourself. None of us can. Because when we wake up to the realization that we're sinners, then we realize, oh my goodness, my entire life, have, has, it's been a life of trying to get the bigger piece of the pie or get in the front of the line. It's been all about me. And I need to repent. Good. But don't come to him and think, well, God, now what kind of morality do you want from me so I can come into your kingdom? So I can do whatever it is you'd have me to do. That's impossible. 
You must come to him and say, Lord, I have sinned against you. I ask you to forgive me of my sins as I repent of them now to you. In our culture today, I know I say this often, but I'm going to keep saying it often. We've got to figure out how to get alone. We're too busy. We're too distracted. When was the last time you just unplugged and said, God, speak to me? How are we doing, Lord? Together, you and I, let him speak to you. He's personal. And God's sovereignty and his salvation should bring you great comfort. Now, people will say, well, you know, God saves some people and God doesn't save others. And that's just the way it is. And tough luck. Well, that's not true. John chapter 15, verse 1. This is a huge chunk of scripture, but we'll read it together. I'll read it to you. Jesus said, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. So you want to ask yourself, am I a fruit-bearing Christian? So what does that mean? Are you watching seasons of your life go along that over time, you are beginning to exhibit more and more of God in control of your life? Are you starting to see the fruit of the Holy Spirit? Are you more patient now than you were last year as a Christian? Do you know more? And are you, are you experiencing more of God in your life? If that happens, you're going to start bearing fruit. Now, outside, I think there's still uh, orange, maybe it's, it's kind of past season, but the orange trees, those orange trees, they, what do they, they produce? Oranges. They're orange trees. Guess what they do? Not going to get a cherry off of them? They're orange trees. There's olive trees. You're going to get olives. You're not going to get an orange off the olive tree. They're bearing fruit. That's what they're supposed to do. A believer is supposed to bear the fruit that God the Holy Spirit is producing within their lives. Every branch that bears fruit, he prunes. Oh, we, none of us sign up for this, but all of us experience it. When you and I are growing in God's kingdom, he winds up, it's like, oh my goodness, this is amazing. And then we wind up getting pruned. What is that? He cuts back. Why, does he, why did that happen? Why am I going through this difficulty? Because out of this cutback, he, so much fruit was being produced this way, but when he cuts this back, so much more, it branches out. Pruning's a great thing. Amen. It just hurts. <laughs> that I may bear more fruit. You are already clean because of the word which I spoke to you. Here it comes. Abide in me. See the word abide? It means live with me. It means uh, you and I, Jesus is saying to you, um, let's live together, you and I. Stay with me. I'll stay with you. Let's do this together. Abide. Listen, he's saying, abide in me. And I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine and you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. How does this work with the sovereignty of God? It works perfectly good. Because God knew, for example, that you, Susie, would come to Christ when, her, when you had heard the gospel, you'd respond. God knew that you would respond, Susie, before the universe was ever created. Based on his foreknowledge. Guess what you're going to do, Susie? You're going to wind up abiding in Christ. The Holy Spirit is going to be speaking to you and drawing you. Listen, church, test yourself. Is the Spirit of God pulling you closer to Jesus in these rough days, in these trying times? You are either now gravitating closer to Jesus or you're beginning to emanate outward away from him right now. And Jesus says to you today, abide with me. That means he's speaking to you, and maybe in your life you're hearing God say you need to cut this off, or you need to make sure that this, that, or the other. He's doing that because he loves you, and he's speaking to you about abiding, and it's so beautiful. Look what he winds up saying. He says that if you abide, uh, verse 7, in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire, and it shall be done for you. That's awesome, because that means the word becomes so much in control that you're thinking like Bible by, uh, by this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit. So you will be my disciples. As the Father loved me, Jesus said, I also have loved you. Church, good night. God bless. Let's go home. <laughs> Seriously, this is Jesus speaking. 
Jesus just said, the, you know how much the Father loves me? Think about it. How much does the Father love Jesus? Jesus says, that's how much I love you. That's how much my Father loves you. Jesus is saying, my Father loves me as much as he loves you. What problem do you and I have that is bigger than that? This gives me security. This gives me comfort. I also have loved you. Abide in my love. Verse 10, if you keep my commandments, this is fun, watch this. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. This is not like, okay, you keep these five rules and you're going to make it. Just come on, you're almost there. Try a little harder next time. That's not what it is. It's getting back to that relationship. Lord, I love you so much because you love me so much. I want to be your child. I want to, I, you, you say the word and I'll be like a slave. I'll do whatever you want because I know whatever you want is good for me. So when Jesus says, keep my commandments, it's not like, oh, I knew there was a catch. <laughs> That's not what it is. It's like, yes. Can I put it this way? If you listen to what I've told you to do so that you might have an incredibly bountiful, fruitful life, Abide in my love. Just as I kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. Absolutely spectacular. You did not choose me, but I chose you. <laughs> and appointed you. You see, I'm a big fan. I, look, you may take issue with this. That's okay. Don't tell me that you disagree because I love it. I'm enjoying this all my life. You did not choose me, but I chose you. Okay. And appointed you. You see the word appointed? I live off this verse, or off that word. I live my life based on appointed. Because you know what? If Jesus says, I've appointed, then you know what? It doesn't matter what happens tomorrow. Tomorrow's Monday, you know that? It's supposed to be my day off. We'll see how that goes. <laughs> what are you doing tomorrow? As a believer, guess what? Appointed. Oh, no, this happened to me on Thursday. Appointed. You can't beat this love. And you can't beat this plan. Appointed you that you should go and bear fruit. Where is that? To the world. And that world, by the way, is this beyond my nose. To the world that you might go and bear fruit. And look at this. And that your fruit might remain. Whatever you ask the Father in my name, he will give it to you. These things I command you, that you love one another. Verse 18. If the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. This is Jesus talking. Are you guys awake still? You guys okay? This is, this is great. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. If you were of the world, the world would go, oh, you're amazing. You're just like us, lost on fire and going to hell. You're just, you're, you're just the best. And Jesus says, yet because you are not of the world, I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. You ever prayed this prayer? Jesus, make me like you. Are you sure you want to pray that prayer? Don't, but listen, inside of you, don't you long to be like him? Is that what you're living for? I don't want to be me anymore. I want to be him. Lord, make me like you. Whatever my plans and thoughts are, just throw them in the back. Bring yours forward. Have you lived or walked enough with Jesus where it's like, Lord, whatever I'm talking about, if anything's goofy, just don't even hear it. And if this prayer was bogus, just flush it. Because you know. It's awesome. But when, when Jesus says this, I, don't, be don't be surprised if the world hates you because it hated me first. You say, I don't know if I like that part. It comes with the relationship. I walk around with my wife and people think I'm walking around with my daughter. It makes me feel great. And if you ever doubt if there's a God in heaven, then you should see my wife as her and I are walking along. You'll say, Jack, how did you get a woman like this? It's, there's a, truly, there's a God in heaven. Okay. So, so, here, so, wait, wait, wait. so, so here's the thing. Um, I'm blessed by association. Well, when you walk in this world with Jesus, you're blessed by association. 
when the world picks up a rock to throw it at Jesus and they miss, they hit you. That's an honor. Did you know that? It says it right here. Well, it was on the screen. It's, they hated me, Jesus says, before they hated you. So don't be surprised if the world hates you. Can you, friends, can you live with that in this social media world? I mean, social media, in my opinion, I'm sorry, it stinks. It created a bunch of wimps. This guy doesn't like me. Who is he? Tell me who he is. Well, that's the thing. I don't know who he is. (laughs) Then who cares? It cracks me up. Just blows my mind. But if you do something that, if you're walking with Jesus and somebody just, oh man, I just hate Jesus, and they throw a rock and it hits you, Jesus is going to hold your hand. He's going to say, I told you. <laughs> just rub it off. <laughs> Shake it off. You'll be fine. You see, Jack, I don't know if I like that. That's just the way that it is. This thing, by the way, I'm in so much trouble, it's not going away. It's getting, it's getting more trouble. But wait, I'm going to show you something in a moment. Here's the thing. I was at the store the other day, and a woman came up to me, and she started crying. And I said, and I thought, she has cancer. So I'm, oh, I'm, oh, what is it? What is it? I'm so sorry you're having to go through all this stuff you're going through. <laughs> and then I, I thought to myself, oh, my gosh, I didn't read the newspaper today. I didn't, I didn't check... M- you know, CNN or Fox app, what's up? And I'm thinking, what happened? <laughs> then, you know, I start thinking, gosh, I hope I left the house with my pants on. <laughs> what's wrong? Oh, this attack about your prayer in Washington. And it's not going away. I was on four or five news programs just this last week. And, and I, what happened? What happened? I prayed a biblical prayer. I, I prayed a Bible prayer. And, and watch it. Church, I thought it would be over. This was January 30th. It's, it's more news, more news, more problem. Oh, oh, oh my God, what's going on? And then last night on the news, my phone, I'm having, I'm at dinner. Look, this is what happens. No joke. This is not a manipulation. This is not an edit. You probably saw it. It came on your news source. It pops up. Look what's trending. Trending on Fox News. Not Biden. <laughs> Look at this. This is... Watch. watch. I prayed a... Wait. Wait, I'm running out of time. I'm running out of time. I prayed a Bible prayer. And I didn't pray it to Congress. I prayed it to God. It was to God. But listen. Pastor who prayed before Congress reacts as dozens of Dems, 26 of them, call him ill-qualified hate preacher. Oh, wow. Oh, that's, that's amazing. Jesus said, I told you. <laughs> right? So put your helmet on, pull your pants up, you can put your mouthpiece in, and in this world, if they're going to throw rocks, uh, just know they're, th- they're trying to hit me, Jack, not you. Remember that. If somebody says, wait a minute, just remember this. This is, and then the next slide, we were, uh, Mark Levin is a constitutional genius, and he wound up picking up on this and just going with it about the Constitution and faith and the Bible. Should people have the Bible in public? From a prayer. The point? That's fruitful unto God. I didn't expect this, and I didn't even... You can't engineer this. But the fact of the matter is, church family, when we abide with him and walk with him, awesome things are going to happen. You can expect him to move. We also know this in verse 7. It says, nor are they all children because they are the seed of Abraham. This is an amazing statement regarding Israel. Listen, Israel is a nation chosen by God nationally. Everybody listen. Nationally, Israel has been chosen by God. The future of Israel as a nation will be forever, says God. That's why they became a nation a second time. The future is all about, read your Bible. It's all about the millennial kingdom and God sitting on his throne 
in Jerusalem. Jesus Christ will sit there. It's in the Bible. It's all going to happen. The point is this. The nation of Israel throughout its history has gone from one bad, disobedient act upon God to the other. Read the Old Testament. It's one big mistake, one big sin, one big act of rebellion against God, one after another. How many times do you read about the bad kings of Israel setting up all of these horrific pagan sites to worship and, and offending the God, of, a God, the God of heaven, the God of the Bible? So many times. Nationally, God speaks to Israel and says, you're wayward, but there'll be a day when I will bring you back. But individually, as individuals, did you know that God is saving individual Jews today? Some say, like never before, the, the uh, words we're getting out of Israel, and not just Israel, but all around the world, Jews are coming to faith in Jesus, all over the world right now. And so what are we talking about? Nationally, at this moment, the nation's lost. It's in unbelief. It's in their homeland. They're back in the land. But the Bible says, moving forward, the nation is going to be brought in and established. But there'll be some Jews who will believe. Not all. That's why he says not all of those who are Israel are of Israel. It's an amazing statement. And so when it says here in the scripture in verse 7, he makes this announcement, and we'll develop it more next time together, but it says now, nor are they all children because they are the seed of Abraham. This is remarkable. The DNA, the descendants of Abraham. Well, we're, we're the descendants of Abraham. We automatically go to heaven. I'm going to give you this passage, and you need to hang on to your seats, because I know that we have this concept of Jesus, meek and mild, and you know, looking like he's walking down the beach in Newport, kind of a Jesus perfect hair flowing in the breeze, awesome, seagulls in the back, robe, sandals, beach day, listen to him, look at, look at John 8, wow, Jesus says, I am one who bears witness of myself, and the Father who sent me bears witness of me, that's two, then they said to him, where is your father, these are the scribes and Pharisees, Remember them from last week? They're wearing all their fancy clothes. They got their pedigree. We're related to Abraham. We got papers. We can prove it. You, on the other hand, listen to what they're saying. Where's your father? Jesus answered, you know neither me nor my father. You can have feisty here. If you had known me, you would have known my father also. Wow. Verse 37. I know that you are Abraham's descendants. I know you've got Abraham's DNA in your blood. But you seek to kill me? Because my word has no place in you. I speak what I have seen with my father. And you do what you have seen with your father. They answered and said to him, Abraham is our father. Jesus said to them, if you were Abraham's children, you would do the works of Abraham. Stop right there before you go. To, well, you can go to the next page, but the works of Abraham, I can give you a test here. The works of Abraham. Jesus said, if you were of my father, you would do the works of Abraham. And I thought about this. Now, maybe you already, you're light years ahead of me, but it, all these years, it dawned on me yesterday. I'm going to make a list of the works of Abraham. Because it's such a big deal that Jesus says, if you're my father, you would do the works of Abraham. All right, here we go. <laughs> Write them down. There's only one. It's faith. <laughs> it's faith. Try to write them down. What, do, what are the... What are the grand works of Abraham? Every step along the way, it's faith with him and God personally. But now you seek to kill me, Jesus says to the Pharisees. A man who has told you the truth, which I heard from God. Abraham did not do this. You do the deeds of your father. Then they said to him, we 
were not born of fornication. We have no father but God. Do, do you get the drift of this? We know what your mother was. And we know what you are. And then they claim to be of God. Verse 42, Jesus said to them, If God were your father, you would love me. For I proceeded forth and came from God, nor have I come of myself, but he sent me. Why do you not understand my speech? Because you're not able to listen to my word. Oh my goodness, friend. Are you not able to listen to his word? I hope not. I hope you can. You are of your father, the devil. Jesus said that. God's word, the logos goes out. Doesn't matter, listen. Doesn't matter if you're Jew or Gentile. When the word of God goes out, what do you do with it? Do you lean back on your religion and your man-made requirements? Or do you embrace the word of God for what it says? It's very black and white. It's very simple. It's very clear. And verse 7 ends by saying, but in Isaac, your seed shall be called. Church, I'm going to ask all of you to stand right now. Just stand to your feet if you would and hear this, please. Isaac. Paul is quoting the Old Testament. Remember Abraham and Sarah? How old was Abraham and Sarah? Answer? Old. <laughs> God says to them years earlier, you're going to have a son. By the way, listen, we'll read it in detail weeks ahead. Listen, God said, you're going to have a son. Everybody listening? This is important. You're going to have a son. Did he say you're going to have sons? No. God said, you're going to have a son. Read the Bible carefully. You're going to have a son. And years go by. Nothing's happening. I don't know what was going on. None of us do. But the Lord appears in what is known as a Theophanies, and he's speaking to Abraham, and says, about this time, next year, you're going to have a son. God speaks. He makes promises. But you know the story. They grow impatient. And I'm sure Sarah thinks she's helping out God. And she says, why don't you sleep with my maid? And uh, the baby comes out. I'll catch the baby. We'll claim it as our own. Everything good. Let's, let's get this on the road. Because, uh, look, Abraham, shall I know pleasure in my old age? That's what she said. Look, I mean, Abraham, come on. You're a sweetheart, but. <laughs> and you've been my husband for 190 years or whatever it was. I don't know how long. <laughs> But uh, I don't think you and I are, you know, not much wrestling going on in our day. And <laughs> so maybe, maybe my maid. And Abraham, you know, he just, most of the time we should listen to our wives. Not always. <laughs> most of the time. This was, not, this was the time, Abraham, why, why did you do this? <laughs> Abraham sleeps with Hagar and... A disaster is created that plagues the world to this hour, and the worst of it is yet to come. Why? Because God said, you guys are going to have a son, a son of promise. And by the way, Sarah, you laughed. When I said this was going to happen, you laughed. I, God said, you're going to have a kid, a son. And Sarah went, oh, yeah, right. I doubt it. <laughs> and, and, and he said, why did you laugh? Can you imagine... He says to her, Sarah, you laughed. She goes, who, me? I didn't laugh. And he goes, no, but you did laugh. Can you imagine God calling you out? You did laugh. Isn't it amazing that the son of promise is Isaac, the son of the impossible, the son of that makes no sense in human terms. Ishmael was the son of Hagar and Abraham. We're going to follow this path in Romans 9. You're going to be shocked. 
Because all the way through, have you ever heard of Jacob and Esau? All the way through, the pathology or the chronology will whittle down your legalism and any self-righteousness you might have and bring you, I believe, before the throne of God in joyful surrender that God works a work and it's best not to kick against him. If God is calling you into his family, my friend, you have been bought at a great, great price. His love for you transcends all and his blood that he offered up is greater than any sin you could have ever committed. All he wants of you is to acknowledge that fact to him. God, I have sinned against you. I have injured you. It's you, my creator. And I'm begging you, Lord, to forgive me. I believe that you died on the cross for my sins and rose again from the grave. I believe this message. I see that from Genesis 3.15 all the way through. It was that one issue. It was that one person. It was Christ. It's always been about Christ. And you are the Christ. I see. It's not my DNA. It's not my poverty or my wealth. It's your great grace that saved a wretch like me. Oh, God in heaven, you would say, make me a brand new person to follow you, to love you from this moment forward. And many times in the Bible, these men and women of God would go to the place of meeting. An oak tree. Maybe it was an altar. They go back. Jacob went back. Abraham went back. Places where you met God, places where things changed in your life. Listen, for those of us who are believers today, maybe you need to go back and renew. And can I end with this? It's not the place, by the way. You understand that? Abraham, the, the, the oaks of memory, awesome. J Jacob at Bethel with the stones, fantastic. It's not the stones or the oak trees. It's what happened there. Don't get caught up in being a first Baptocostal card-carrying member of the method, Methodist Catholic thing. There's no card punch in heaven. Do you know him personally? So our grandkids just packed up and went back home to Northern California. Now, my kids already know this. They're in their 40s, and it's just like, oh, here it goes again. So we're driving down Coast Highway, and those of you who know uh, Coast Highway, Newport, where Newport and Huntington meet is at the riverbed. And so just south of the river is Orange Street on Newport and PCH. So who cares? Well, you don't, but I do. <laughs> because at the end of Orange Street, there's volleyball uh, courts in the sand out there, and that's where I met my wife. So when I'm going down PCH with anybody, I'll say, see that right there? See that right there? Right there. See those nets right there on the beach? That's where I, I met Lisa. So my kids grew up hearing that. Every, every, here he goes. And I announce it. That's where I met Lisa. Right there. Right there. And so just, same, just the other day, we're coming up on it. And my daughter's like, here it goes, here it comes. <laughs> hey, grandkids, hey, kiddos, kiddos, look, look, look to the left. Look, see right there, that's where, I, that's where I met your Mimi, right there. That's where it all happened. Without that meeting, you wouldn't be here. <laughs> that's a fact. But we don't pull over and hold the sand in our hands and go, ooh, wow. <laughs> it's what happened there that sanctified it. It's not it. Don't get caught up in religion. Well, I got my first communion, confirmation, baptism, my whatever it is. That's what happened there. No, it's not it. It's him. 